Welcome to the Referrals Podcast, the show designed to help everyone from the solopreneur to the Fortune 500 company win the referral game. If you want to build a company with an army of ambassadors and raving fans who speak highly of you and refer you willingly, you are in the right place. And now, here is your host, Michael J. Mayer. Welcome to another amazing episode of Referrals Podcast. I am so excited to bring this guest to you today. You and your socks are going to be knocked off. Your socks are going to be knocked off as we go into how do you succeed in sales without selling? Whoa, that is that is what you're going to learn today. I, I cannot wait for you to get a load of this new way to do sales with Diane Helbig. But before I do that, I need to, first of all, thank all of you for helping us attain top 100 status in the podcast world. I mean, our subject is referrals. It's not business. It's not marketing. It's not like health and wellness. It's, a, it's I mean, how amazing is that a podcast that's so niched out like referrals is getting so much attention. And I'm telling you, it's because of you. It's because your word of mouth. It's because of you spreading the word and telling others about what we're doing here. And it's because we are having awesome guests each and every week. So first and foremost, thank you, listeners. Thank you, viewer, viewers, for, for helping us do that. Please subscribe. Please rate and review. And uh, thank you for hanging out with us once again today. I have to give a special shout out to one of our listeners to Michaela in the United Kingdom. Yep, we made the UK, we made the big time. She says that a brilliant, uh, so a shout out on 7L and the Referrals Podcast, a brilliant book giving practical, practical tips on how to build your network effectively. I've read a number of books and listened to a number of podcasts like this, and most of the tips that I heard on these shows still feel like an epiphany, brand new. Contrary to other support literature, this one is written and the book is written in novel style, which makes it not only easy, but also desirable to read. And then the story continues with the referrals podcast, my insert. This is referrals podcast, real people, real stories, real referrals. Everything's real here. And Michaela says she can't quit listening and she didn't want to put the book down. Great book, great podcast. Thank you for all you do. Michaela, thank you for writing that review and very much appreciated. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is, speaking of 7L, join me in a first time ever book club led by the author. So, in some cases, you've seen where the the book. Well, in some cases, you've seen where the actual book is written by an author. That's a whole <laughs> ghostwriter story for later. But I wrote Seven L, and then a lot of times with the audio book, sometimes authors will, uh, you know, they'll have somebody else do the audio book. In this case, I read the audio book, and but something we've never done is is I've never personally led a book club on Seven L. And we are doing it in June. Four weeks, deep dive into 7L, led by the author. And I'm going to tell you things about 7L that you never knew about this little book. Things about character names and character titles and little subtle things that Michelle does and Rick do that you are going to be like, OMG, that is so cool. Plus, it's going to be a, a walk along the journey of your 7L system trip, and you get to learn more about the 7L system as we go through it, and the result will be referrals. By the end of the June, end of June, going through this book club, not only are you gonna get referrals, but you're also going to learn how to get more referrals than you've ever dreamed possible without asking for referrals. So you can join me in the first time ever, authors led 7L book club, by going to 7lbookclub.com, the number seven, letter L, bookclub.com, register online, 7lbookclub.com. We're gonna make June the most amazing June you've ever had, 7lbookclub.com. Hope, hope you'll join me. Now, without further ado, I need to bring on today's guest for the Referrals Podcast. Today, we have Diane Helbig. Diane is an international business and leadership change agent. 
She's an author, award-winning speaker, and she's the most awesome podcast host ever. It doesn't say that in here, but I'm just telling you. As president of Helbig Enterprises, Diane helps businesses and organizations operate more constructively and profitably. Diane is the author of Succeed Without Selling, Lemonade Stand Selling and Expert Insights, and is the host of Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast. Diane is the founder of Business Opportunity Network, a business development program where business therapy meets growth. Diane is a member of the NSBA NSBA Leadership Council and a member of of the advisory board for the American Institute of Sales, Marketing, and Management. Diane is here today to talk to you about how to succeed in sales without selling. Welcome, Diane, to Referrals Podcast. Thanks so much for having me here, Michael. Well, I'm so excited about this conversation. I mean, you can (laughs) succeed in sales without selling. I mean, what a what a what a concept, right? You mean I don't have to be all pushy and chevy and and you know badgering and interruptive and just dis- disruptive and and all those. So you know the 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 old ABC right was A always B B C closing. Yes. And you have a new ABC. So how how have the ABs of, ABCs of selling changed over the last few years? So in my estimation, the ABCs of selling are now always be curious. Mm. I I don't think always be closing ever worked, Uh, but that was the mantra. That's what we were taught and that's what people tried to do. So they were always in sales brain, right? They were everyone they saw, they thought was potential customer Mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. So, right. But being curious, then you're open to learning about people. You're open to figuring out who, is and isn't a good resource or a good client. You know, you you get all those really good referral relationships because that's what you're paying attention to. Do you mind if I take notes as we go through this? Yeah, this is do. already good. Always be curious, which you know leads you to be in in question mode versus telling and selling mode, right? Right. And and so how can you be more curious? Like what's, what is that, what does that look like to go from always be closing to always be curious? What, how do, how do I represent that? Or how do you know a salesperson is doing that? So boy, that is such a great question. I think, you know, a salesperson is doing it when they are not talking, when Mm. they are not telling you everything about their product or service, when they aren't being persuasive or pushy or salesy or, you know, any of those things that most people don't like doing or experiencing from Mm. someone. So they're genuinely interested. They're listening attentively. They're asking questions that aren't fishing questions. Like they really genuinely are interested in learning about you, your company, your needs, your challenges, successes, you know, everything. I love it. So it's a a much more consultative approach, Mm question-based, um, so what, I mean, I know this is totally off script of what we talked about earlier, but I'm, I am genuinely curious. I, I, I want to know better. What are some, what are some great sales questions, you know, that, that lead to selling without selling, if you will. Right. Yes. Right. So first of all, I think, um, when you're in that sales appointment, that, that conversation, you really want to ask questions, not only about the situation, but about them and their experience. So for example, have they ever used a vendor like you before? You know, have have they ever had this experience before? If so, would they mind sharing what it was like? What worked? What didn't work? (laughs) That's a nugget right there. That is a pearl because it's like, have you like in the coaching world, it's like, have you ever been coached before? Right. You know, and if they say yes, you have a certain level of question. I mean, if yes, yes. all right, why did that work out? Why did that not work out? Yeah. How did that coach win with you? How did that coach lose with you? Right. And then if it's yeah. like, no, I've never been coached. It's like, well, what do you think that might be like? You know, right. I love that. Oh, my God. Yeah. And that's such a simple question. Right. right. But we don't ask it. Yeah. And yet it's something we really need to know, because you know what? If they had an experience with someone like us before and they didn't like it, what didn't they like about it? Yeah. We're trying to identify if if we want to do business with them, just like they're trying to identify if they want to do business with us. We both get to pick. Mm-hmm. But a lot of salespeople think, 
they don't get a choice in that. They just have to take all the business that, you know, comes their way and they end up with bad business, bad clients, bad experiences, no money. Yeah. So above and beyond curiosity, how do you succeed if, if you don't sell? Yeah. So <laughs> that's a great question. For me, it's realizing that selling is telling, right? Mm -hmm. Selling is talking about, you know, trying to persuade, convince. And the truth is you can't convince anybody to buy from you. Mm -hmm. People will buy from you when they trust you. So really the way you succeed is by building really meaningful relationships with other people out in the community and giving of yourself. Like when you meet all of these people and you get to know all these great resources, then you have a toolbox of resources that you can give to other people to help them problem solve. Mm. And that's how you become a trusted entity out in the world that people want to do business with because they know you're going to tell them the truth. They know you're genuine, that, that you genuinely want to help them and that you'll tell them if you can't help them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're showing up all the time. It's just you really caring about other people. It's just a game changer. So I love that. And, and one of the things that you really touched on there that I hope like we have a community called the generosity generation and, and it's on Facebook and it's a Facebook group, very powerful. You know, what we don't get a lot of is complaining or venting or the negative negativity or the naysayers or the trolls, right? It's much yeah. more supportive and encouraging. And here's the thing that I hope that they th know is that that community is like you said, a tool to use in your one-on-one -on -one networking and in your other relationships, when you, when they have a problem that you can't solve, right. it can probably be, be solved by someone in our community. You know, early yeah. in early in the community days, we literally had like a 1929 Rolls Royce that somebody wanted to sell, very unique product, and it ended up that someone in our group knew someone who yeah. was a collector. And we ended up selling that night, not we, but the group ended up selling the 1929 Rolls Royce to someone who knew someone by using our group as a resource. So your network is a resource and the stronger and bigger and better you build it, the, the more useful that tool is. But not only that, what you're saying and what I'm hearing is that not, not more valuable we are. The more valuable our network is, the more valuable we are, which exactly. gives us more confidence in those networking situations, right? Exactly. That is exactly right. So, so you know, that leads us down the networking path, mm. which I know your book speaks <laughs> quite a bit about, and I'm a fan of as, as well. And so what are people doing wrong when it comes to networking? Right. And boy, that could be an episode of its own, <laughs> but let's, let's narrow it down to a few okay. things that they're doing incorrectly. Yeah. So um, the, the biggest thing that people are doing incorrectly is that they are going to networking events, looking for clients mm. instead of looking to learn something about someone else. Mm. So they, they think they're supposed to walk away with business. It's not true. They miss out on other potentially really great relationships with other business people who aren't going to be clients, but are going to be really valuable in their world. And they end up with the opposite of what they're looking for because people don't like that. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to be treated that way. So everything, you know, when, when salespeople go into a networking environment, looking for clients, they get the opposite of that. And then no one wants to talk to them. And they can't grow their business that way. So powerful because that's what they've been taught in sales for years is that everybody's a prospect. Everybody's a lead. Always be selling, right? Yeah. Always yeah. be closing, always yeah. be selling. And, and the truth of the matter is, is we, we really need to quit looking at people as prospects right. and start looking at, at people as ambassadors and champions. Yeah. They're, they're not 
the business, but they're the referral sources. And if we start treating people as, you know, what if we met and treated everyone like they could be the greatest referral source in the history of our life? Right. Wouldn't the dynamics of that relationship change instead of always being in sales mode? Yes. And it would be so much better. And I think the salesperson would enjoy it more. Yeah. I don't think, you know, small business owners and salespeople don't like to have to behave in the way that they've been trained. So they don't do it or they do it badly. And so it, they can't succeed. You, you can't succeed at A if you're not going to engage in some sort of a growth process, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I tell you, you, it, you brought up uh, memories of, I, I was in some networking groups, some chambers, and I just remember this guy who would always start a conversation or his little pitch with your water is killing you. <laughs> like that was, that was his opening, like, and, and of course he sold water filtration systems and things like that. Right. But <laughs> but it literally got to the point where if I knew he was coming up next, I would go to the restroom because it was so fear-based and it yes. was so disgusting, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, it, I, I don't know if he got sales doing that. And I'm sure he didn't come up with it himself. I'm sure he was trained to 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 do his five-minute spiel that way. Right. But, you know, after one time, it it's a pretty a pretty disgusting open and wouldn't it have been better if maybe it was a more consultative and interested approach versus trying to be more interesting and scaring the crap out of people. So, yeah. um, I love that. So, you know, we, we say a lot of times people don't want to be sold, yes. but people want to buy. Yes. And, and, you know, we are consumers and everybody's a consumer and, yeah. and we, you know, we, we love to sometimes even have an identity around, being a consumer with Amazon these days, being a consumer is a little bit like Christmas every day, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you see the package on your front door or at your front door and you're like, Oh, Christmas, right? Even though you bought it and you shipped it to right. yourself, it, right. it feels a little bit like Christmas every day, That's so true. but you know, how, do, how are people buying in today's market? So people are so much more informed in today's market than they used to be, you know, when the whole always be closing thing came up, the the consumer really did not know about the products and services. They really needed the salesperson to explain to them what the benefits were right. and how things worked and whatnot. We don't live in that world anymore. Once mm. the internet came along, the consumer became very well educated. And so what we have to know is they're researching us, they're researching our industry, they're doing their own investigating. So when they walk into a conversation with us, they already know or think they know a lot of things about our industry and possibly our competition and potentially us. So we have to know that because I think it's great because hopefully that stops us from this feeling like we have to tell them everything. Right. right. And helps us be Makes in our that job actually questioning. Easier. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. We don't have to inform as much or educate as much. Right. We can ask them. See, this comes back to the curiosity. We can say, so would you mind sharing with me what you know about this? Right. Right. Yes. You know, tell me, I don't want to tell you stuff that you already know. So that's a well, brilliant question. Yeah. Is like a realtor could easily mm -hmm. set down across from a seller and say, so what do you know about what a realtor does to sell a house? Right. Right. There, there's so much brilliance to that question because A, it instantly probably puts the seller in a position where it's like they thought maybe they knew a lot, but now they're having to explain to a professional. So they're like, oh crap, maybe I don't know as much as I thought I did. And it actually gives the realtor a good position because they can explain the gaps Right. and educate them on the gaps while also showing what they know. Yeah. You know, so I, I absolutely love that. Yeah. Love that question. Yeah. I mean, they could also say, you know, would you share with me what you know about the market right mm. now, you know, about the housing market right yeah. now, because yeah. people have sometimes misconceptions about what's going on in whatever industry you're in. 
And you don't want to assume that you know. You don't want to assume they need what you have to sell because you don't know whether they do or not. That's and you right. don't want to assume that they don't know things or that they know more than they do. I love that. And I mean, because it is uh, too often the, the, the salesperson is so worried about getting out of them what they need to say versus what it really needs to be is this approach of getting out of the other person uh, enough so that they can partner in the process to make it happen. And so I, I love, so what do you know about the market? So what do you know about what a realtor does? Or so what do you know about what a lender does? Or so what do you know about what a coach does? Yeah. And and then they, they, they tell you, and there's a big difference between thinking you knowing you know, and explaining what you know. Yeah. So it's, it, in many cases, they probably never answered that question. So the, the consumer or the potential client may stutter around it, may articulate it poorly, may keep going. Um, uh, and, and what that actually kind of does is, is it really, it puts you in a position where, all right, you know, I understand where you're coming from. And that, that, that the person explaining is like, well, maybe I don't know it as well as I thought. So there's an opportunity for growth and an opportunity for partnership. Whereas, you know, the internet enabled consumer in today's world thinks they kind of know everything. And the millennials think that if you gave them an iPad and a phone, they could run the shuttle, you know, or launch the shuttle. So they might be able to actually. Yeah, but they're probably pretty close to it. If it, if it was like, a video game they right they, they could, could do it in a heartbeat they could probably right. do it <laughs> so you know so you know this kind of goes back to you know the the networking and the marketing and and you know this concept of a target market Ooh. so what why are target markets so important especially in today's world well, the simple answer is because everybody is not a target market. Mm -hmm. And and when we, and, and most salespeople believe that everyone needs what they have to sell. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, A, they don't. Mm -hmm. And B, you can't sell to everybody because no one will hear your message. When you have target markets, then you know the potentially there are companies or people in that market that need what you have to sell. So you can message directly to them and then they hear that message and then you can have a conversation to then explore whether there is indeed a need and whether you are the best solution for them. And so, so how do you pick target. that? Right. Ooh. So how do you, how do you, how do you find your target market? And, you know, people do talk about niche and niche yeah. Yeah. and, Sometimes you worry, am I going to make it so narrow that nobody, you know, it's not, there's not going to be enough money in it. Right. Yeah. So how do I, how do I pick a target market? Yeah. So what I usually suggest to people is look at your clients, you know, pick, pick your, your top 20 and, and that you love that you just, if you could have more of them, you'd be thrilled. You, you'd love every day that you came to work and actually list what the characteristics of, mm. you know, of them. What are you selling to them? How much revenue are you realizing? What's the relationship like? How do they communicate? Do they value what you sell? What problem are you solving? You just, you know, you go through the whole thing. And, and if you're selling B2B, what industry are they in? If you're selling B2C, you know, more about their demographics with, you know, gender, age, education level, you know, where do they live, all of those things, because that you want to duplicate that. Mm -hmm. So you may find out that in your top 20%, if you sell B2B, that there's like three industries you play really well in. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are your targets. Yeah. I love that because one of the things that you're, you're forcing through this, looking at the top is this thing I call momentum matters, right? So there's mm -hmm. 10 things that matter most. One of those things is momentum. Well, you know, you may have never thought of healthcare as being one of your industries, but you've got a couple of clients in your top 20% in healthcare. Well, you've got momentum, or at the very least, you can create more momentum in the healthcare 
based on your two or three clients. You can, exactly. you know, get their testimonials. You can get yeah. their connections. You can, you know, figure out who they came from and express appreciation or right. get more involved with the, you know, the trace. Um, so there's yeah. a, you know, there's a ton and it's really momentum matters. And, and in a lot of cases, people, you know, they don't even look at that, right? They just look no. at the client and serving the client versus where is the opportunity? And right. I think that's a big thing that a coach and a consultant can really help you with is where are the opportunities that maybe you didn't see before because you're so busy servicing, you know? Right, right. Exactly. That That is exactly right. And I love this idea of momentum because you, then you have a story to tell. You know how you're helping that industry, that target. You, you know, you know the kinds of problems they might have. That's right. You, you're right. Which just helps you with the questions you're going to ask. Love it. I love it. And, you know, then you're, yeah, I love that you took it to the next step, which is all right. Now tell the story of your clients, mm -hmm. right? Tell that. And, and, and it talks about like, what is their category? What are their biggest fears? What is their worst case scenario? What's the nuclear case scenario? And, and what are they thinking before you solve their problem? And then what did you specifically do to solve that, that client's problem. I mean, there's, there's so, I mean, because here's what, I mean, so going through this exercise that we're describing right here, you're going to discover more about your company than, That's than right. you probably ever thought because it's real, yeah. right? When we look at our company, we think it's one way. In fact, we would use two or three words to describe our company. And then all of a sudden, if we asked our clients, what are three words you to describe your company? And it's very rare when the words we think and we want match up with the words that the clients are saying yeah. about us. Right. So we need to figure out, you know, where is that disconnect? What is that, you know, what is that problem that we're really solving? And we need to change our vernacular to be more oriented around their language than our language. You know, Boy, it's such a good point because we, it, it's so true that your value is only as relevant as your client sees the value. It's not yeah. what you think the value is. It's That's what right. they get out of it, right? That's right. Yeah, so you have to know the answer to that. And that's so important because, um, and and I have to tell you, there, there's been conversations the last couple of weeks within Referco with with kind of that whole subject is, we have somebody that's, that's kind of voicing it one way, but the needs of the clientele are different. You know, they're, they're just like what, instead of like coming up with all of this stuff on your own about what you think they need to know, why don't you just ask them what they need to know? You know, ask them yeah. what you do for them. Ask yeah. them what, what right. problems do they have? And then it's like, all right, they have these three problems. Well, you can't solve that one. You can't solve that one. Yeah. But you know what? This one right here, you become the man, you become the woman. Yeah. for th for that thing because that's yeah. right up your alley it matches your values it's a lot of fun you enjoy yeah. doing it and you know what they need it so in instead of doing all this over here you know focus on that one thing to help as many people as possible within that element and right. it's amazing how many people go to the things they hate because they think they have to do it yeah. as part of their job and yeah, it's like no. you don't have to do that no you don't and you don't want to be talking past your prospects yeah. because they're not going to hear you, right? Yeah. You're going to totally miss the opportunity. But but salespeople tend to want to do that because we yeah. want to kind of show how smart we are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's like, you know what? I mean, I that was a big lesson I had to learn is quit explaining things in a way that makes you feel smart and look smart yeah. and start explaining things and asking questions in a way that the consumer gets smarter. Yeah. You know, the customer gets smarter and really boil it down. That's, that's, you know, I hopefully that's what people feel with seven L is, you know, it, it's a super simple book. Well, right. you know what? It works. Why? Cause it's super simple. Exactly. If it's not super simple, it simply won't work. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, and I, what I usually say to people is the more you're talking, the less they're listening. Mm. So you're telling them all sorts of things. They're not even hearing cause they don't care. Yeah. It has nothing to do with their situation. You have to find out first and then talk about what you do in relationship to what they're telling you. Mm -hmm. That's where the connection comes in. That, that you know, avoids 
objections, being ghosted, all of those things, because now both of you are walking down the same road. Yeah. Love that. Love that. So what do you, what do you enjoy most about what you do? Like with Helbig Enterprises, what, what's your, what's your favorite part of your job? I think my favorite part of my job is when my clients say something like, well, I just asked myself, what would Diane tell me to do? And then I went and did it. And I think that's so great. I've gotten into your head. You're finally thinking differently, you know, cause it, it really is a shift. It's a paradigm that's shift right. for people. So I, I love working with small business owners, helping them embrace ideas that are actually going to work for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're like, there's no canned program or anything. It's getting to know them and helping them create strategies they'll implement and watching them succeed. So how do you get them to believe you, Diane, that I can actually sell without selling, right? I mean, how, how where, where does that inflection point happen yeah. where they have been, they've watched Boiler Room, yeah. they've watched Glenn Gary, Glenn <laughs> Ross, they've watched The Wolf yeah. on Wall Street, right. and they used, and these people have been wildly successful, of course, at the end of all those movies, everybody dies or goes to prison. Thank so you. maybe that's not the greatest uh, yeah. example ever. Right. But it's one of those where, you know, how do you get them to just try your method and and discover? Because you and I are cut from the same cloth with, with how we teach this. I, right. You know, we know there's a way. Yeah. That doesn't have to be that way. Right. It can be this way and it works. Yeah. But a part of the people that come to us don't believe us. No, that's true. It's too easy. Right? right. It's too easy. Right. So how do you get them to believe you? Well, first we talk about what they're currently doing and whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. So they, they can feel it. They can embrace that. Okay. Well, what I've been doing isn't working. And then we create uh, just a step-by-step -step strategy and they agree to just take it one step at a time and we'll evaluate as we go because mm -hmm. they have to experience it in order for that light bulb to go off and for that change to happen. It is a big change. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. we just have to, we start with, you know, helping them craft the questions they need to ask when they're in the sales conversation, what are they going to do when they network? And if they can just do one thing mm -hmm. so they can get a conversation, then we can worry about that. So, mm -hmm. You know, they break it down, they do it, and, and they're amazed at, wow, that actually worked. Yeah. Yeah. So let's yeah. keep doing that sort of thing. Yeah, I love that. You know, it, it's uh, I teach these things, like I teach a class called, like, Dominate Your Database. And the only reason it's called Dominate Your Database is because it has two D words in yeah. it, right? <laughs> so, and the long A at the end makes some yeah. sense. But it is interesting that, um, you know it's not about domination at all. You know, yeah. it, 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 it's funny when people are like, they thought dominate your database was going to be these, these, the, these rough and tough calls and these difficult phone calls right. to make and these difficult things and this hard stuff. And, you know, a lot of, and I think, I think you and I should, should call our sales methods like hardcore sales <laughs> or, or, you know, the toughest sales job in the world. And then they come and they're like, oh, that wasn't hard at all. <laughs> like, no, that was easy. And it's like, it, it, it's such a, uh, it's such an eye opener. Yeah. And like you said, you're a change agent. Really, that is, yeah. that is what's happening in the world anyway. And, right. and I, I believe that the salespeople who continue to use the traditional approach are, are like the dinosaurs. I think they're going to be extinct uh, pretty quickly because the consumer is getting tougher. Right. The consumer is getting smarter. Yeah. Uh, the consumer is more informed and they can complain about you to a hundred thousand people in about five seconds. Exactly. Whereas before, if you made somebody mad, well, you just kept going. Right? right. Right. And, and I think companies need to really pay attention to what is happening to their reputation by having salespeople behaving in the old traditional way mm -hmm. because typically what happens is the person can last maybe a year maybe two and then yeah. they have to leave because they can't get those people back on the right. phone right so, so it's yeah. very short-sighted what the consumer experiences with the company is boy they have a revolving door there's always somebody new coming through mm -hmm. here and look at how these people are they're they're it's not respectful it's 
unpleasant. It's uncomfortable. I don't want, you know, they could have the greatest thing in the world. I don't want to work with them. Yeah. So companies are really hurting their brand by having their salespeople engage in, in these ways. So that that's a, that, that's a great point because I, uh, 77 year old that I know, friend of my mom's bought a car on Carvana, right? Yeah. So first of all, I was really impressed that she had the internet savvy to, to make that happen. <laughs> no kidding. But, but she was so thrilled, Diane, that, and she couldn't believe it. She's like, you mean if I order a car, <laughs> it will show up at my front door? Yeah. So not only, I mean, now, you know, so what's the opposite experience? What has her experience been through the years? You go to a car lot, you get badgered, you get into a small, really tight, probably cold room with some really stiff chairs and the manager, or they go get the manager and the manager beats yeah. you up a while. And, and then the, the F and I guy beats you up for a while. Now I'm, right. I'm, I'm exaggerating a not little bit, I. but not very much. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It, nobody wanted to go to the car lot. Right. People avoid car lots. Yeah. And and guess what? Now there's a solution where, I mean, for 77, she loves her car. Uh, the nicest gentleman was helping me with all the, wouldn't it be great? I mean, you don't even get that at a dealership with a new car. They no. don't tell you what all the buttons do. No. You know? So yeah. she was, I mean, I, I swear to God, I have a nice car. There's buttons. There are things. On that car, I have no idea what they do, yeah, right? Exactly. And I would not want to push them while I'm driving. <laughs> yeah. It it so I mean the yeah. fact that this lady bought a car, had it delivered, and had it all explained, maybe paid a thousand bucks more, right? Maybe, maybe two thousand, maybe. maybe, maybe. But it was so worth the convenience and the hassle, and her experience wasn't the same. Yeah. Her experience was far better right. because she got the car explained. She she has more. I mean, here's the thing. Once you have something explained on your car, that car is yours. Like yeah. you own it. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. I just I just thought that was just such a great example of, you know, people are going to avoid those salespeople and they're going to find another way, even if it's maybe not even the perfect solution for them. Right? But don't you think when Carvana first came out, people were like, buy a car? and have it delivered to my house. Are you out of your mind? Don't I have to sit in it? Don't I have yeah. to drive it? Don't I have drive to drive it? it. But, but it's successful because people don't want to go have that experience. That's right. Okay, well, if the car dealerships want to still compete, they're going to have to stop behaving that way. Yep. They're going to have to change the way they're interacting with their customers because yep. the customer has options now that yep. they didn't have before. Yeah. I mean, the, it got to the point in the car world where they were giving away microwaves, TVs, gold chains yeah. for a test drive. Like, oh, Kansas City, two Chiefs tickets just to test drive a car. Wow, right. And if you're, and if, yeah. Right. And if you have, I mean, if you have to do that to get yeah. somebody to come to your business, right. what does that say about the value of your business? Right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's uh, it, it may be legal to bribe. But is it a good idea to bribe, no. even when you can? And I don't believe it is. I I, I, I believe they should want to come experience right. whatever well, they need. Right? I agree. Yeah, so, I totally Sounds agree. like you have the same dog that I have. So <laughs> we have a couple of dogs at our house. and Yeah. I, that's what I love about referrals podcast is it is. It's real people, real stories, real <laughs> referral. It's real. Like you may hear Miles or Chief bark in a little bit, and you may – you may hear a lawnmower, you may hear whatever, but uh, <laughs> what I love about it is it is real and, and uh, the information is off the off the charts. Yeah. And that's, I, I just, I want you to know how much I really appreciate your, your coming on and educating everybody. I hope that every single person who's listening to this embraces your message, Me embraces <laughs> the, you not only can succeed without selling, I believe the future is that you will have to sell without selling. You'll you'll have to sell using a consultative yeah. curiosity approach. Always be curious. I love that. It reminds me of one of my mentors, Howard Brinton. He said, get out of judgment, get yeah. into curiosity. Yeah. Get out of judgment, get into curiosity. And, yeah. and uh, I, I love that. And it stuck with me forever. So, Diane, 
you know, you, you've got a free gift for people. And I have yeah. to tell you, I absolutely love that you're doing this. You know, tell it, tell them about what, what you want to give them. So this is a free chapter uh, from my book. They can download it and read it. It'll give them an idea of what we've been talking about and, and what is actually in the book. Uh, so they can decide for themselves whether it's something, you know, whether they want to read the rest of it. Which they will. And when they do, how do they get the rest of the book? Ah, they can go anywhere books are sold. They can go to Amazon, uh, Bookshop, Barnes & Noble, anywhere you can buy a book, they can they can get Succeed Without Selling. Succeed Without Selling. Has a good ring to it, dude, doesn't yeah. it? Succeed Without Selling by Diane Helbig. I love it. All right, yeah. well... First and foremost, that's your call to action. That is the number one takeaway you should have from today's show is go get Succeed Without Selling by Diane Helbig. You're going to love it. It comes across as a conversation. It's almost like she's there consulting with you in the room, having a conversation over a cup of coffee. It's a warm read. It, you'll love it. I know you will. And it's going to give you lots of practical advice on how you can get more sales, get your business more sales, while also having a life that's more fulfilling, more fun, and you can live with yourself a whole <laughs> lot better, right? Versus yeah. having to do the the knockout punch oh, approach. Yeah. So, yeah. Diane, thank you so much for coming on Referrals Podcast. I really appreciate you being our guest today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I've so enjoyed the conversation. It flew by. It, it did. really did. Yeah. So thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, go get Succeed Without Selling by Diane Helbig at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever you need to. Download her first chapter if you're the hesitant type. But if you're the hesitant type, you're probably not even listening to Referrals Podcast, right? We don't have any of those. <laughs> no. So just, just go get the book. Order it today. Make it happen. Do it now. And then I want to just re-invite all of you to join me in our first ever author-led book club, the Author's Inner Circle 7L Book Club, 7LBookClub.com. That's the number seven, letter L, bookclub.com. You're going to get lots of goodies. You can find out more information at 7LBookClub.com. I can't wait to tell you some of the secrets that are in 7L that you uh, very few, my wife doesn't even know a couple of them. And I'm going to be revealing those during the book club. I'm excited about doing this. It was uh, my team's idea and I kind of came to it hesitantly. Now that I'm like, we're doing it. It's like, oh my God, this is going to be so much fun. So 7LBookClub.com, check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say thank you again. Please subscribe, please rate and review. Uh, please download everything that you're doing with the uh, referrals podcast. And do you have a guest that you might suggest for referrals podcast? Just email us at podcast at referco.com. We love our guests. We love having great guests like Diane Helbig. Diane was referred to us by mm -hmm. Stacy Randall. Yeah. And I'm telling you, that's how we do it, right? So I love that, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy, for referring such a great guest. Diane, thank you for being such a great guest. And thanks for being here today. Thank you. And thanks, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. We'll see you on the next episode of Referrals Podcast. Tune in weekly.